The gardens here at River Hill were first created by my husband's great, great, great grandfather, who bought River Hill in 1840. His passion was collecting the rhododendrons and azaleas being discovered in the Far East and bringing them back to River Hill. Subsequent generations have continued his passion and the planting, and we now have year-round interest for visitors to enjoy. However, currently, due to the coronavirus, the gardens are closed to visitors, a strange and unprecedented turn of events. Our challenge over the next few weeks will be to get through these difficulties. River Hill is no stranger to difficult times. Over the past 180 years, the gardens have survived through great wars, financial crises, family tragedy, and of course, the great storm of 87. I'm confident that we'll get through this together. Our aim is to help the community to continue to raise money for the charities which we support, and of course, to maintain the gardens. I've really enjoyed making this film. It's been a great excuse to get out into the gardens and see spring unfolding. And I hope over the next few minutes, you will enjoy your submersion into River Hill. Arriving at River Hill, the house initially takes centre stage. The main part is older than it looks and dates back to 1710. John Rogers chose River Hill both for its fine and expansive views and acidic soil, perfect for growing rhododendrons and azaleas. River Hill is still a Rogers family home, with four generations currently in lockdown during this coronavirus. Today's early spring tour will give you a flavour of the beauty of the gardens as they gradually wake from their winter dormancy. Our first stop is the Wall Garden, redesigned in 2011. The curvilinear grass terraces are inspired by the cultivation terraces in the Far East and are overlooked by the Himalayan hut, perfect for views across the Weald. The frothy fountains and the white trunks of the Jackmontii birch look wonderful in today's spring sunshine. We can't wait for this long border of peonies and allium to flower and the old crab apple is just coming into leaf. As we look back to the house along the neat rose walk beds, the magnolia and cherry blossom catch our attention, as well as some of the early rhododendron flowering in the jungle. These are followed by the towering Wellingtonia and the spreading cedar in the old orchard, shading both the sculpture by Julian Wilde and the ponies. As we head eastwards along the hillside, we mustn't miss one of my favourite early spring sites, the Primrose Meadow. Thick drifts of primroses have spread naturally across this area resulting in a spectacular carpet of yellow. We have been fortunate and many of the camellias in this sheltered glade at the entrance to the rock garden have managed to escape the recent hard frosts. Our Edwardian rock garden has only recently been restored and reopened to the public. It had been lost and overgrown for over 50 years. Created in 1907, over 200 tonnes of stone were moved from a nearby quarry in Penshurst. Quite an undertaking when you consider they were using horse and cart. The pond and cascade have also been restored and over 80 different species of fern have been planted, which is starting to look wonderful in the dappled light.
to carefully climb the steep, rough stone steps out of the glade towards the wood garden, taking a last glimpse back at the pond and the reflections. The wood garden was created in 1909 by Ed's great-grandfather, John Middleton Rogers. It usually looks at its best in later spring, but I'm thrilled to find some striking colour to show you already. The maples are also coming to leaf, and I've even noticed a few early bluebells. Generations of Rogers have loved trees. This delicate pale yellow azalea is contrasted by the dark trunks of the group of Scots pines planted by Ed's grandmother, one for each member of her family. We would usually be getting ready for our bunny hunt now, hiding the hand-painted rabbits under the rhododendrons, ready for children to find when they visited for Easter. What a strange year this is. Rhododendron King George's bark is such a beautiful colour and texture, often overlooked later in the spring, when we are all overwhelmed by its towering blooms. How about this for a perfect camellia? At the bottom of the orchard sweep, the arboreum, or tree-like rhododendron, tower in height above Troy. The interesting shadows on the lawn are thrown by the huge balls of mistletoe in the lime trees. We are now approaching the terraces to the south of the house. Designed by Sir John Naismith in 1844, these gave the family a huge tennis court lawn overlooked by two terraces near the house. The summer house was used to store croquet mallets and as a lovely place to watch the games from and enjoy the fine views across the parkland and beyond. Over time, the ragstone walls began to deteriorate and collapse, and in 2016, with the help of a generous grant from the Country Houses Foundation, we were able to rebuild the 75 metre long lower wall and restore the summer house. We're still saving up for the upper wall. With the gardens closed to the public, we have also been taking the opportunity to sort out storage rooms full of wonderful family possessions and unloved furniture. This is a treasure trove of social history, a glimpse into forgotten worlds and lifestyles.
hidden away on a dusty windowsill, protected by a special dome, we found the top tier of Ed's great-great-uncle's daughter's wedding cake. At more than 110 years old, I wonder if it's still edible. We finish our tour with a glimpse of rhododendrons just starting to flower, a reminder of what is still to come. I look forward to showing you these and the bluebells next